Every year of my life, that's almost 52 years so far, the world has become a worse and worse place. Today's guest on Nature Bats Last is Dar Jamail, staff reporter at truthout.org. Dar's own website is darjamail.net. Today's show is a call-in show. U.S. listeners can call in toll-free on 8888-74888. International listeners can call the studio directly on 01-605-562-5199. If you miss those numbers, they are posted on my dystopian Facebook wall. As a disclaimer, I'd like to state that Dar and I are personal friends, and I've had the pleasure of having Dar stay with me on Rakino Island. We toured some of the North Island of Aotearoa doing research together for his forthcoming latest, ominously entitled book, The End of Ice. Dar, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Kevin. Great to be with you. It's a pleasure to speak with you again. Why don't we start off in what I would refer to now as the boiling Arctic? As we speak, the Arctic has seen temperatures above zero when it's cloaked in 24-hour darkness. There have been temperature anomalies of 20 degrees C above average. How can this not be termed an emergency? For the coming melt season are incomprehensible as the prospect of, sea, of a sea ice-free Arctic ocean looms. Should we start there, mate? I think that's absolutely the best place to start because of the obvious, <clears throat> excuse me, global implications. Uh, I, I mean, first, I think we should just pause for a moment on one of the things you just pointed out. If people can just envision the North Pole, the iconic North Pole, in the depths of winter, the sun doesn't shine for one minute of the day. It hasn't even risen yet. Uh, for the first time uh, through the depths of winter. So it's in total utter darkness and you're at the North Pole and you're seeing above freezing temperatures. I think if people just ponder that for a minute, you can start to understand how out of balance everything on this planet is, that something like that can happen, that should that should scare all of us. You know, I mean, you know, as a journalist sometimes and certainly as scientists, uh, people are, are very leery of, of being referred to as an alarmist, but when you're in a life and death situation, I think you're morally obliged to be an alarmist. And, and I actually have interviewed scientists that have said, I am officially sounding the alarm bell. And certainly those studying the Arctic, uh, you can find several of those scientists now officially sounding the alarm bell. That, And this has been going on for for years, you and I have been watching this and tracking this for years, but it has ha it has hit a point, a new point this winter that is is uh, making even the most hardened of us at this point shake our heads. Absolutely, one of the one of the huge issues for me as we uh, monitor the unraveling of the biosphere is scientific reticence, and I also think journalistic and reticence as well. No one is prepared to put their hand up and point at the elephant in the room and, and the level of the emergency. In January 2015, you published an article titled The Methane Monster Roars, where you quoted Paul Beckworth saying, it is my view that our, our climate system is in the early stages of abrupt climate change. That unchecked will lead to a temperature rise of five to six degrees within a decade or two. Yesterday, I was sent the latest paper from Andrew Glickson, a recent uh, a guest of mine on the show. He sent me a paper titled, The Onset of Climate Tipping Points, Methane and the Future of the Biosphere. One quote in that paper is, it is becoming clear the Earth is entering a period of uncontrollable climate tipping points. Can you extrapolate on that a little bit for me well I, I i couldn't agree more i think uh you know as we just discussed the evidence is right in front of our face whether it's these uh almost science fiction level anomalies that are happening in the arctic uh that just happened in the arctic to record-breaking wildfire seasons across the u.s to droughts to these major rain anomalies like hurricane harvey 
uh, that hit Texas this past summer and several of the other hurricanes. I mean, all of which, you know, there's there's ample scientific studies linking them directly to uh, to climate disrupt to human caused climate disruption. And I think that when we talk about the fact that we are already in abrupt climate disruption, that is. Uh, unarguable at this point, if you just look at the, the extreme weather events that are happening on a daily basis now. And, you know, I write my climate, uh, my monthly climate disruption dispatch for truth out. And it's, you know, it, it, every month I do it, I'm still blown away by how fast along we're moving. And so when we hear these predictions of we could see a five to six C increase by, you know, within the next X number of years, whether it's uh, 10 years or by 2035 or by 2050, as some of these predictions have have been made, like the BP and Shell uh, 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 document that you pointed out, Kevin, a ways back that was published in The Independent, uh, or a story about it anyway, published in The Independent, Independent this last fall, talking about that they're basically preparing their shareholders to see a 5 to 6C increase by 2050. Um, you know, it used to be that that these kinds of predictions, people were really, really blown away or thinking they're they're very, very outlandish. And a lot of the general public still might believe so. But but I think that that's changing. And I think that these they're they're becoming more believable mm -hmm. now when we're seeing this dramatic evidence in front of our faces every single day of what's what's happening around the planet from record high temperatures to record wildfire seasons to this you know, insane phenomena that's happening in the Arctic right now to the the how the rapidity of, of glacial loss uh, <clears throat> around all of the planet. You know, the reality is that by 2100, uh, and, and this is not me, this is, I, I always am, am just sharing information that I've gleaned from uh, talking to experts for articles I write or people that I've spoken with for my book research, that there will not be any more uh, land terminating glaciers anywhere on the planet by 2100. Uh, I mean, think about what that means and with water supplies and, you know, how many billions of people are reliant upon water just from glacial melting alone. So what happens when you take away all those glaciers? What happens to humans' capacity to feed ourselves when there's 7.5 billion plus people on the planet? And so, again, is it, a, is it alarmist? to talk about this stuff, because in reality, we're just, we're not being even alarmist. We're simply talking about what's actually happening. Absolutely. I, I would like to actually talk about the 2100 meme and how that is used as a way to kick the can down the, down the road. But uh, I, we have a caller, everybody, and it's Professor Guy McPherson, the former host of the show. And so um, good for you to call in, Guy. How's it going? Good. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing very well. I have two of my very best friends on the planet on the show. How how cool is that? Guy, awesome. um, you you have a, a trip or a tour coming up shortly. What's that about? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing the East Bay Sierra Club dinner series again late in March and also late in April. It's a three-part series, and I'm unable to make the third part in May. But Jamin Shively, who invited me, earlier to speak as, as part of this series has organized this John Muir lecture series that is um, looks like it's going to be pretty dynamite and we're still working out the details of how that's going to work out. Well, cool. That's interesting that Sierra Club are opening the door to your perspective because I find them extraordinarily conservative myself. <clears throat> as do I, and I think this is an example of one person wearing the banner of the organization, willing to step outside of the conventional box. And and I think that's wonderful. I don't think he has the approval of the CR Club at any level, but he's following in his father's footsteps as being the host for the East Bay CR Club dinners. So good for him. Uh, very cool. Is there anything specific that you wanted to ask that? Yeah, I want to ask both of you, actually, Dar Jamil. Um, hello, by the way, and thanks so much for being Kevin's guest today. Hello, and Kev, if you could both take on this question, I, there, there's no doubt in my mind that we're in the midst of a planetary emergency. It was, after all, a paper in the annual review of Earth and Planetary Sciences that projected 
a nice free Arctic in 2016, plus or minus three years. And I would be stunned if that year didn't happen this time around, 2018. And, and an ice free Arctic, of course, we haven't had with the species Homo sapiens on the planet. So are we in the midst of a planetary emergency? Yes, absolutely. Now, I have some, some ideas of my own about why nobody is declaring an emergency, even though I suspect most high-level, high-ranking politicians and CEOs are fully aware. But I'd like you to address that question. Why is nobody calling for a planetary emergency if, like us, there are surely other people who are in positions of greater influence than the three of us who know about this? So can you hit me with your answers on that? I think that it's, uh, it's you know, as, as a journalist, it's always follow the money. So it's a situation of when you have global political leaders that are essentially all lobbyists for the corporate powers behind them, because I think in, in most countries around the globe now, that's the state of corruption of all the political systems. And so that being the case, I mean, I'll just use the U.S. as the most obvious and blatant example of all of them that when, you know, you've literally got a, a, a clown as a president and the people behind pulling all of his strings are clearly the fossil fuel industry, the NRA and whatever other businesses of that, that are of and from the system that's essentially devouring the planet. If they're the ones pulling the financial strings, then uh, it doesn't behoove said government to make any changes that will affect those profits of those companies. And so that's the short answer. And so, and then try and take iterations of that and apply it to different countries around the globe. And so that's why at best you see these kind of half measure uh, lurches toward like the, the Paris Accords a non-binding agreement that nobody's under any obligation to follow anyway. Uh, uh, you know, just these kind of really paper mache facades of, of to make it look as though we're doing something. Uh, and, and so that's why nothing's going to change. No change is going to happen from a government, not any real change. And even European countries that are doing things like uh, making far bigger emission cuts than the United States and getting, you know, start getting ready to start banning um, fossil fuel, fossil fueled cars from uh, capital cities and countries, et cetera, et cetera. You know, those are those are nice uh, gestures, but they're just token gestures because a real response to the emergency that we're actually having would actually look something like immediate, full, globally government coordinated responses of we have to stop all fossil fuel emissions ASAP and start punishing anybody who is not following that, you know, by law and uh, behaving accordingly. The, and that would only be an effort towards, again, being fully honest with populations, saying, look, the genie's out of the bottle and we're just going to see what we can do to mitigate it because that's the moral thing to do, period. Not that it's going to stop anything, not that we're not still going headlong into disaster territory because we are, um, but, but you know, that's what it should look like. And instead of that, what do we have? Um, a, a media in the United States that in, I saw one report that in 20, in 2016, the entirety of the tele, the big television networks in the country spent under one hour total for the entire year combined reporting on climate change. And so, uh, you know, again, status quo, uh, just go back to sleep and keep buying stuff. That is exactly true. And it is so bizarre that for anyone who's paying any attention at all, we know that this is the biggest issue unfolding on the planet. And why is it not the lead item every night on every mainstream news uh, show? And my take on that is that in the last 50 years or 60 years, the whole, the whole planet has been taken over by the corporations. The whole narrative is controlled by the corporations, and all the corporations are interested in is business as usual. In World War II, in America, the American uh, automotive, automotive industry was put in park, and all of their factories were used for, um, unfortunately, making weapons, but they went on, on that big plan of con completely concentrating on the one issue of the day. But that's not happening. All, all that 
we're looking at now is business as usual, pedal to the metal, off the cliff, and no holding back. And we all know about global dimming as well. I suspect most of the populace doesn't, and that's in part because well-paid climate scientists will essentially never raise the issue of global dimming. So even if we were to stop burning fossil fuels today as a result of the lack of global dimming, the planet would experience a very abrupt global average rise in temperature. So as some people have called this the McPherson paradox. We, we keep burning fossil fuels to the metal, pedal to the metal, and that continues to heat the planet. Or we turn off the switch of industrial civilization and that heats the planet even faster. So it seems damned if you do and damned if you don't, but nobody's talking about that. I wouldn't mind betting what you've just referred to as the McPherson paradox is the reason why so many climate scientists and biologists won't speak out about the severity of the crisis. Everyone's seen what's happened to you. The minute you put your hand up and said, whoa, we're in serious trouble, you were shot down. You did, lost access to research grants and, and all of the things that are associated with it. And I would imagine a lot of scientists are thinking the same thing, that why would we go down the McPherson Road when you can see how rocky and torturous it is? And perhaps, Star, that is a, a reflection with your industry, with the journalism, where journalists are a little bit reluctant to point the finger and say what a dire situation this is, because that's any positive effect on the share prices of those corporations you just discussed that now own the entire media? Well, that's right. And there's also a really interesting phenomenon in, in journalism. Obviously, this is not only in journalism, but it's it's very prevalent in the media. Is there There is a, a very big factor of groupthink happening. Like, for example, when I was working for Al Jazeera English over in Doha, and, and it's sometimes working down on the, the news floor uh, where the TV anchor sat and, and gathering all of that information that we, following the editors, we, we would be oftentimes waiting to break, waiting to report on a breaking story until another major media outlet took the leap because we were too afraid to take the leap and go there because, oh, what if we ended up being wrong or this, this story ended up being over sensationalized or something like this? So that's just one example, and that happened often. And it wasn't just Al Jazeera English that did that, but it's, it's, all, it's all of the media outlets to a certain extent are at least in some part implicated in that sort of a group think, well, we're not going to report on that that way because then we would be the lone wolf and really going out on a limb. Nobody else is going to report on it. And I think that's a lot of what's happening with the, the climate disaster and people not reporting on it. But then there's also, of course, you know, the corporate funding behind media outlets, i.e. all of the major TV outlets in the United States are certainly under the same kind of pressure as, as the politicians, but in a slightly less obvious way. But that's certainly another uh, factor in the equation. And then there's, uh, you know, lastly, I would say there's, um, you know, the, the news as infotainment, that, you know, news outlets, and I'm talking about the major corporate outlets, they want to give people what people want instead of what's actually the news. And so the news is pretty consistently geared towards, well, you know, we don't want to do too many upsetting stories a day. We know that people really want Trump, so it's going to be all Trump all the time. That you know, we don't want to waste our time uh, talking about what's happening in the Arctic and other other planetary emergencies. So that's that's another thing is really soft peddling uh, what what media outlets even define as news to uh, other uh, to to a to a population that uh, they think really doesn't want to hear about it. And unfortunately, in a lot of instances, especially this one, they're they're usually right. How spectacularly inverted is that? You would expect a news item, a news organization would jump at the opportunity to break a story. And and what what you've just uh, described is they're doing the opposite. They, they want someone else to lead from the front. It's just completely inverted, like most of the things about industrial civilization. Well, it, it exactly is that, and that's because it's not really journalism anymore, certainly not in the major outlets. Uh, it, it's, it, it is literally backwards because it used to be that, yeah, the big deal as a journalist is can I break the really, really big story? And now media outlets are way more concerned with 
ratings and can they bring enough people in to watch to keep their corporate sponsors happy so that people watch the ads so that it pulls in more money and it's that has become antithetical to breaking news stories and vice versa breaking a big news story that's going to have dramatic implications economic implications as well as life implications uh it's just not good for their business model and that shows how absolutely antiquated and really out, out of whack that that so-called business model is. We even have one for a, a media outlet that's supposedly uh, tasked itself with bringing people factual information so that they can live their lives uh, more intelligently. Bravo. You know, gentlemen, I don't want to dominate the show, so I'm going to sign off now. Thanks for the opportunity to chat a bit, unless you say something that really trips my trigger. I won't be calling back in. Thank you both for what you're doing. You are courageous men, and I am honored to be associated with you at any time in any way. Be well. Thank you very much, Guy. It was a pleasure to have you on the show for those few moments. Call in again anytime you like. Thank you. Um, Da, I would uh, I'd like to go back to um, the Arctic for a moment, if I can. In your March 1st article on Truth Out, titled, Scientists Warn February Melting Near the North Pole Really Extreme, and I'll quote from it, in another shocking development, Alaska's Bering Sea lost the full one-third of its ice in only eight days. If this lead continues, it's hard for me to envisage us avoiding an ice-free Arctic sea this year, and the implications for that are terrifying. You, you did an article about uh, Dr. Natalia Shukova and Igor Semilatov from the uh, University of Fairbanks in Alaska and their concerns about the methane emissions from the ESAS, the East Siberian Arctic Shelf. Could you uh, give your opinion about where we are with regards to those? Right. Well, it's it's uh, and I've I've written about this as, as well as it's um, I have a whole chapter on permafrost and methane in my forthcoming book and what uh, Shikova and several of her colleagues have been studying and writing multiple scientific studies on for quite a few years now is their concern about the methane trapped in the shallow seas of of the Arctic and and particularly the eastern Siberia uh, shelf where that's where the brunt of it is and they're very concerned about the fact that as the uh, summer sea ice <clears throat> is is going away it's exposing more and more of that area to uh, direct sunlight and even warmer uh, temperatures in the water and so it's basically speeding up the the thawing process of that subsea th permafrost and releasing the methane and so uh, it is being documented now there are increasing amounts of methane plumes around parts of the arctic and the only question is do we get the 50 gigaton methane burp as shikova has warned us about that could happen as she said, essentially at any time, that we're already at a point where we've changed the system enough from causing enough of the sea ice to melt and warming the water enough and warming the atmosphere enough that literally this could happen any time. And that would be the equivalent of more than doubling uh, the uh, CO2 equivalent amount in the atmosphere than what humans have already emitted from since just the advent of the Industrial uh, Revolution. And so... That gives people an idea of how far along we already are and what the threat is. And then in addition to that, there are absolutely already um, multiple instances of uh, these methane plumes, uh, both subsea and on land. They're already uh, increasing in number. It was just last summer, there were two more of these giant methane craters in Siberia that when these were reported by uh, people living in the general vicinity, <clears throat> excuse me, they even reported seeing fire and smoke when these burst, unlike the other ones that uh, they found these giant craters, Russian scientists went down to the bottoms and found high concentrations of methane. But this was the first time last summer that they were actually incendiary. And I've talked to some scientists about that <clears throat> and, and there haven't been any papers released yet. People are still theorizing and trying to figure out what's happening beyond what they know, which is clearly these are, these are giant uh, vents of methane under pressure then suddenly being released into the atmosphere. And there's 
craters with ejecta all over all around them and so it's happening on land as well and so this is a big deal because as i think many of the listeners to this show are probably aware that methane is a far more potent greenhouse gas than co2 it's 100 times more potent on a 10-year time scale so it doesn't take near as much methane to be released to cause uh, dramatic impacts in, in the amounts that are already being released and the amounts that uh, certainly look inevitable to be released are uh, worrisome to put that mildly. And I think this is, I, you know, with, with the sea ice going away rapidly at this point, as, as Guy just said, he thinks it's this year, whether it's this year or sometime in the next few years, uh, when it goes away completely, that's when um, the, 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 the methane situation becomes even that much more important because it seems like what Jacoba is warning us about then becomes inevitable. Are you aware of the uh, new scientist article and uh, a Daily Telegraph article about a large trawler that was discovered in the Siberian Arctic where it had dropped horizontally through a methane plume and, and the boat had just been sailing along on the water then there was a massive discharge from the ocean below so that the, the, the water column was just pushed away by the gas and the, and the trawler dropped horizontally like it would down a lift shaft and it hit the bottom with no damage. It was just when I, when I post this, uh, this um, show on my website with all the cor corroborating uh, articles, I'll include that article for people to see how, how precarious the situation is. Jennifer Hines and I toured New Zealand in 2016, and uh, Jennifer, on one of her slides, she had a she had a slide of a pingo off the coast of New Zealand that was six kilometres in diameter. The discharge, you know, obviously that you know when it came out, it wouldn't have been that big, but the discharge crater was six kilometres in diameter. If you sailed into that, you're you're heading straight for Davy Jones's locker. <laughs> yeah, and and you know these again, it's it's that's a just another iteration of the the shock value of what's happening right in front of our eyes when we talk about what we did at the top of the show about the Arctic, the North Pole, seeing above freezing temperatures at this time of year when the sun's not even up. To me, that has the same kind of shock value. It's it's you know I I don't know how much more shocking really things can become. And that's a dangerous thing to say because we all know that they're going to become far more shocking. But, you know, each time one of these events occurs, like like Hurricane Harvey sitting over Houston and dumping enough rain that it, you know, NASA later reported that it literally pressed the Earth's crust down several millimeters because of the weight of the water was so much. That's how much water was there. And another statistic just to kind of bring home to people, you know, the, the freak nature of these events that there was uh, the equivalent uh, of rain fell from Hurricane Harvey that was the equivalent of one million gallons for every Texan. And considering there's more than 30 million Texans, that's a lot of water. So uh, again, you know, this is, you know, these, this is kind of sci-fi level things that we're seeing happen. And it's, it's, it's very alarming and it's very worrisome. And, and it's scary, especially when you consider that, you know, for those of us unfortunate enough to be living in places that are right on the front lines, like people in Bangladesh, people down in South Florida living in the Keys, people living in these areas that in not so many years from now, they're literally not going to be there unless they choose to go back by boat. Um, you know, these people understand it. They do not need any explanations. They, they are shocked that, you know, they're living in a place where they've had ancestors in a place like Bangladesh for thousands of years, and now they're going to have to leave. So, you know, they are alarmed and they do get it. Again, it's, it's those of us in the privileged West that, uh, you know, for right now anyway, there's somewhat of a buffer between uh, being in that type of situation. But I think inevitably, all of us, it's going to be, be made so obvious by what's happening. So whether it's by wildfires or drought or economics, but, you know, all of us are going to be taking this on the chin, no matter what the level of denial is. Unquestionably.
there's a few things I'd like to point out about Harvey. Um, when when there was all that water in Texas, and as you said, it, it uh, depressed uh, on the land and, and flattened the land out or, or sunk it. When you have those big events like that, or when you drain an aquifer, uh, you're either putting more weight or taking weight off the tectonic plates. And there is always the possibility that when you when you do that, you'll have more earthquakes. I think most people would concede that we're seeing more and more earthquakes as climate change uh, progresses. And then with all that flood water at uh, that was in Texas floating around, sometimes submerging uh, petrochemical works, there must have been an enormous amount of pollutants that were mixed in with that that flood water, and that most of that or a lot of that would have drained out into the Gulf. So here we go, you know, the Gulf that you covered so well with our deep water horizon and the pollution that it suffered. Here's, here's an, another attack that people aren't really um, joining the dots for. And I think when we talk about our, our, our climate catastrophe that's unfolding, we have to join all the separate dots and not look at things in isolation. You know, this is the multiplicative effect that you get from tipping points and so many different things unfolding. A classic um, thing that happened during Harvey is that because of the technology that we have now, we can see these cyclones coming from quite a long way, or hurricanes in, in, in the northern hemisphere from quite a long way away. And we have a chance to prepare for them to some degree or other. But in, in, in Texas, the nuclear power stations kept generating new electricity. They didn't go into shutdown mode. They don't go into to, to become to prepare for the 135 mile an hour sustained winds that they had. And I looked into that and I found that one of the reasons why that they, they didn't go offline is they have contractual obligations to remain online. So there's a penalty fee for them whenever they go offline and aren't, aren't available to supply to the grid. So these people, for pure financial gain, they kept the, the nuclear power plants going while they were had an extraordinary cyclone bearing down on them. This is the, corp, the nature of the corporations. They are not going to do anything that affects their bottom line in the short term, because, of course, all this is short-term thinking. Right, and these are very important points. Uh, and and uh, another, I'll, I'll add to that. I actually uh, was in Florida again recently, this time giving a talk. And uh, just like when I went there uh, May a year ago uh, of 2017 to do research for my book on sea level rise, flying over Florida, over much of the state, and looking down from the plane, and the words of Dr. Harold Wanless, he's a he's a sea level rise expert at University of Miami over in Coral Gables, and one of the few scientists that I've I've met with who is completely unafraid to tell the truth because he warns he thinks uh, it's highly likely we'll see 10 feet of sea level rise by 2050, if not sooner, and that we could see 20 or even 30 feet by 2100. Not even to talk about what happens after that, which is of course far worse. Uh, but one of the things that Dr. Wanless said that I, I hadn't thought of, which is, is one th a point that you just mentioned, Kevin, is you know, by, by our own definitions of what qualifies as a glacier by the area of ice that is there and the fact that it has to be moving, that by those criteria, there will not be a functional glacier in Glacier National Park by 2030. And he said, there will not be functional glaciers just about anywhere on the planet that are land terminating glaciers by 2100. He said that too, you know, and he's scratching his head and saying, yeah, I've, I've had to become battle hardened as I go out and I watch this thing that I've loved my whole life and study, I'm watching it go away, you know? And so he's he talked a little bit about you know, PTSD as a scientist and dealing with that. And he's another one of the few scientists that's been very outspoken, unafraid to talk about this in the media and tell the truth about what's happening. And it made a very, very big splash when he did it. And so I, I just want to acknowledge that, that there are some really, really good scientists out there. 
very aware of what's happening and unafraid to talk about it and tell the truth, regardless of what the consequences might be, whether it's risking funding or or being um, blackballed within their own community by their colleagues or things like this. So it's, it's important to acknowledge that. And then I just do want to remind people that wherever you live, there's there's a part of nature, even if you're in a city, not that far from you, that's still functional, whether it's a forest or a river or mountains or glaciers. And, and it's just really remind people that it is an urgent time to go out and spend time with the planet because um, we're, we're watching a lot of these things go away before our very eyes. And so it's important for us and I think the planet as well that we keep uh, um, bringing our hearts out there to it and spending time with it. I, I concur 100%. Uh, I have two wonderful friends on Rakino Island, uh, Stephen and Stacey Thomas, who have started a, a not-for-profit nursery called the Rakino Island Nursery. And I volunteer, volunteer down there propagating native plants on a, for a rewilding project that we have on the island. I believe the biosphere will collapse very, very quickly, and I'm still going to be planting trees. I would love to be the last sapien on the planet to put a seed in the ground, and I'll happily be that person. But I think you're, one of the things you alluded to is the grief that we're all suffering as we as we study this, and, as, and it, it can be a little bit uh, either intoxicating or um, um, you, you get a fix on having to get up and look and find out what the latest information, because there's a tsunami of information coming in from every direction. I interviewed uh, uh, Professor Paul Ehrlich, who wrote The Population Bomb, and he's a biologist, and he wrote a, a recent paper with an biological annihilation in the title, and it was about the collapse of flying insect populations in Europe, in Germany specifically, in their national parks. The same thing is happening in Australia. There's been um, articles written about it recently where people are seeing the same thing. I've got anecdotal studies that I've done in New Zealand of, of driving at night through areas country areas where when I was a child the car would be completely bug splattered and now there's hardly an insect on it. I think we have to, I'd really like our listeners to get their head around tipping points and the multiplicative effect of all these things. If you have a look around, there is chaos breaking out in all sorts of different fields. A lot of it not even particularly related to climate change. The, the, the fall of of the flying insect populations is probably more related to us bathing the planet in herbicides and insecticides rather than as, so, as much as climate change, but climate change is a multiplier on that. I'd like to talk to one, one more issue as we're sort of drawing down to a close to the end of the show, is the ecological consequences of imperialist wars and the carbon footprint of the Pentagon and the military-industrial complex and the non-aligned nations who have to ramp up their own defences in anticipation of that imperialist threat. One of the accusations that's lodged against me when I talk about extinction and how late in the day we are is that people say, oh, yeah, but if people listen to you, Hester, they won't do their own things. You know, they won't try and lower their own carbon footprint. Well, I don't. I won't accept that. I believe it's a complete straw man argument. I see the reality is, is that nothing. That even I believe we should be doing all of those things and lowering our carbon footprint. Nothing we do as individuals is going to mitigate the fact that the, the corporations and the military industrial complex have this raging um, builder of munitions and armaments and warmongering around the planet that it completely dwarfs anything that individuals on their own can do. How, how do you see that situation? I completely agree with those facts and then add, but if people ask me what, I just talk about what I do when I give my talks now. And, you know, I don't, pretend to tell anybody what to do because I don't know what anybody else should do at, at this point in the crisis. So I just share what I do and I say, yes, despite all these facts that our backs are against the wall, 
that all of this is now upon us and we know what's coming and it's going, today is better than tomorrow for the climate, right? That it's, it's only going to keep getting worse. Um, but I have a solar powered house. I work actively regularly to lower my carbon footprint. I grow my own food. I'm about to increase that food production rather dramatically. I live on my land with people that are trying to do the same thing and live their lives in the same way because it's the moral thing to do. You know, like I, you know, people say, well, you know, we're, we're, we're totally screwed. Why not just go have like the mother of all parties? It's like, well, that's not how I want to go out. I want to go out on my feet with my own dignity and because it's the moral thing to do and because it's still the right thing to do for the planet. And so this, these few acres where I live, surrounded by a bunch of beautiful trees in the Pacific Northwest, I'm going to, I am going to spend my days trying to take care of this little piece of the planet because it's the right thing to do, period. I, I am exactly on the same path as you. There was a, a recent interview you did where you talked about look at being able to look young people in the eye and, and what, what you did where, while we were watching this unfold. And I firmly believe in doing that as well. But I'm also not going to, I'm not going to bullshit young people and say you can fix this or it's your job to fix this. That is so cruel and unfair to young people. We've only got one minute now to go. I'd just like to um, wind up with your latest book. When will the end of ICE be coming out? Uh, it is currently slated to be uh, released to the public in January of uh, next year. So we're still about uh, nine months away. I'm editing it right now, and uh, I'm very excited about it, as is my publisher, The New Press. But it, it will be available uh, in, in January for take a month. So, uh, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. It's, it's called the end of ice and it's, uh, it's, it's going to be, a, I, I feel like, I feel confident that it's my best book yet. Let's hope it hits the, hits the bookstores before collapse unfolds. <laughs> Brother, um, I'd love you to come back to New Zealand sometime soon before all that shit goes down. And I'd like to thank Efrazine for his theme music for the show which uh, the studio will play for you now. Thank you every, very much, everybody, for your time. Have a great extinction. Mother Nature Mother Nature She's gonna get you She's gonna get you Mother Nature She's gonna hate you And she's gonna get you Gonna get you in your picture That's almost 52 years so far. The world has become a worse and worse place. Every year we have polluted more water than the year before. Every year there's been less clean air than there was the year before that. Every year there are fewer, fewer species on the planet than the year before that. We're driving 200 species a day to extinction. We're about to see that turn around. The living planet is about to make a comeback. And that's really, really good news. She's been a class now, she's coming out swinging. She's been